events and as iqvc coordinator i am much glad that all of our departments have responded very enthusiastically in this matter today's program is a part of it as you all know today's topic of discussion is covid vaccine a viewer's perspective from the bunker we are much happy to say that the name of the topic has been suggested by an by our honorable jesus person himself so with these few words i like to request our principal sir dr shomin chandra to deliver his inaugural and welcome address dr chandra principal sir please thank you so gavan am i audible hello yes 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 you are audible ha chhe ha suna jaachhe ha ha suna jaachhe okay very good afternoon to the distinguished guests colleagues students and ladies and gentlemen welcome to the webinar titled covid vaccine a viewers perspective from the bunker these days since last year we have been passing through the sars cov 2 pandemic all over the world scientists and doctors are putting extraordinary efforts in understanding the nature and variations of the virus nicknamed covid-19 we all know the paraphrase prevention is better than cure therefore we have been asked which we should follow to abide by some precautionary or safety protocol in order to prevent the spread of the virus and thereby make ourselves safer while at the same time the scientific community is putting its best efforts in finding a cure the novel corona is a single stranded rna virus and rna viruses generally have very high mutation rate which make it difficult to make effective vaccines against them it has been a challenge to the researchers to develop a vaccine which will be highly effective against the most predominant mutations of the virus in today's webinar we will hear about the latest developments from the shanti sharup bhatnagar awardi professor dr vaskar saha scientist g national center for cell science pune i hope that we all will be much enlightened from this talk with these little words i welcome you all and announce the webinar session open dr pal thank you principal sir for your kind remarks may uh, may i now request yes. may may i now request my departmental colleague dr shomitra mondol to formally introduce dr bhaskar shah thank you thank you prabhada for give me uh, for give me this opportunity uh, we know today's speaker is dr bhaskar shah dr bhaskar shah is an indian immunologist cell biologist and a senior scientist at national center for cell science pune he is known for his contributions in the field of immunology and cell signaling he is an elected fellow of two of the major indian science academies national academy of sciences and india and indian academy of sciences the council of scientific and industrial research the apex agency of the government of india for scientific research awarded him the shanti swarup bhatnagar prize 
for science and technology one of the highest indian science awards in 2009 for its contributions to biological sciences he is also the recipient of national bioscience award for career development of the department of biotechnology in 2007 dr saha obtained his phd from indian institute of, institute of chemical biology calcutta in the year 1993 he did his postdoctoral fellowship at naval medical research institute and also served as principal investigator at nmri and faculty department of medicine usu hs bethesda usa during the year 1996 to 1997 he joined national center for cell science in 1998 where he served as a scientist g and carried out his researches on immunology immunology and cancer biology his early researches were focused on immunology and he has since shifted his focus to explore the therapeutic uses of his findings at nccs he is involved in a number of projects including leishmania macrophage interaction cd40 signaling dc subset mediated priming against prostate cancer development and regulation of regulatory t cell in leishmaniasis and dc subset in leishmaniasis and regulation of t cell responses he has published several research articles reviews and book chapters that could be found in pubmed he has also served as a faculty member of pune university and vidyasagar university with these few words i am honored to invite dr bhaskar saha to deliver his valuable lecture dr saha please Thank you. Okay, before I start, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Pragamoy Pal for inviting me to this lecture, and also to the principal sir, Dr. Shobhan Chandel, and nice introduction by Dr. Mandal. Uh, I'm not sure that I was the right person to talk about uh, this COVID vaccine because I have. never worked on covid vaccine so i am very much like all of you and um, it's a view from bunker like i have said and i look at uh, the progression all the happenings from a very distant place so basically what i will discuss today is an observer's view from a bunker about this SARS-CoV-2 and which is all of you know as a killer of the century after the spanish flu so almost 100 years so this is the virus let's say schematic presentation that you will find the virus has uh, on the surface the spikes spike protein so which is actually an assembly of three subunits and inside it has this nucleocapsid and its genetic material is single stranded rna and it is an enveloped virus so the membrane is taken from the host cell when it bursts out when it assembles all its components so this sars sars cov2 or this virus binds to its receptor which is known as angiotensin converting enzyme 2 uh can i move this so this is a host cell membrane okay host cell membrane on which we have its receptor named SE2 or S2 
that binds to the spike proteins on the virus. And once this happens, then this whole virus is endocytosed. So that is the mode of entry. And this virus, once inside, it releases its RNA, which you will see here as the genomic RNA. And this genomic RNA first is translated to generate a polyprotein where by a polypeptide having uh, many different proteins are tied together and they also activate the protease which self cleaves from this and this protease by means of proteolysis of these two protein complexes or precursor complex releases the enzyme called replicase. Then this replicase uh, helps in the replication or rather executes this replication of the genomic RNA. So we have the negative strand RNA, which from which we get different RNAs or rather mRNAs like spike protein, protein 3A, 3B, envelope protein, then membrane protein, then different other proteins, protein 6, 7A, 7B, 8A, 8B, the nucleocapsid N and N9 protein. So these proteins, these mRNAs, are then translated, you see here, and in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and then transported through Golgi. So these proteins are then released here along with the genomic RNA plus stand, which is coming from this the negative strand of RNA. And then this nucleocapsid and the proteins are put together and they are assembled and the virus is made and released. So this, these are different steps in the virus replication such that when this SARS-CoV-2 virus gets into a host cells and start replicating, these are the different stages and at least three different target stages where you can um, inhibit the virus. For example, the entry can be inhibited by a monoclonal antibody, which is known as 47D11, then glycerzin, then a peptide, which is basically the repeats of the peptide of tyrosine, lysine, tyrosine, arginine, tyrosine, lysine, and then two acetamido alpha d glucopyranosilamine derivatives, and hydroxychloroquine. So although later on people have found that hydroxychloroquine is not a really a drug uh, for SARS-CoV-2 and it, there have been a lot of debates and a lot of unwanted incidents uh, uh, with New England Journal of Medicine and other places. So basically we can safely get rid of or nullify hydroxychloroquine's claim as an anti sars cov anti cov drug. So basically, once the entry is inhibited, the other target could be its replication, where again, remdesivir, you all know, is the most wanted drug, and it's the 4,500 rupees drug that is sold at a rate of around 45,000, 50,000, any, 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 any amount in black. And besides that, there are protease inhibitors because you know these all these replication uh, conducting or containing the uh, enzymes they are produced by this proteolysis. So if the proteases are inhibited, uh, then all these enzymes like replicases etc will not be produced. So one very important target is a protease inhibitor, which is lopinavir and ritonavir. However, people have seen that lopinavir and ritonavir haven't uh, gotten as much efficiency uh, as remdesivir. And of course, the requirement or the efficacy of remdesivir also is pretty questionable. So the other point is because this is a virus, so it uses uh, host machinery for its replication, translation, assembly, and everything. 
and therefore the host cell proteins are also targeted by a host of different um, agents and these are nitazoxamide, seracatinib, cyclosporin A, alisporivir, dexamethasone which all of you know which is the steroid and tocilizumab Many of you know that, which is a monoclonal antibody, uh, because this is Zumab. This Zoo stands for human, and this tocilizumab is actually blocking the IL-6 uh, receptor. So this is anti-human IL-6 receptor antibody, and also interferon beta. So basically, these are different reagents or agents which uh, target different host cell uh, activities or cell proteins or cell processes etc to carb the replication and release of the virus so despite all these things there are at least two gross populations that we observe uh, uh, and what we find is and what we find one group of patients or one group of people who clear the infection very well and the other group which cannot clear the virus so the virus is successful in growing in those people and develop this COVID-19 disease so what happens and what makes the difference I have tried to put in here so the people who react very well and clear the infection are in green and those who cannot become diseased their reaction is put in the reddish shed so as soon as sars cov 2 enters through the nasal and tracheal space and it rolls down the trachea what happens it interacts with the goblet cells and the other tracheal cells who are primarily um, toll like receptors and other receptors uh, activates these cells and among several things uh, that is released mucus is one very important uh, reaction so this mucus try to put or rather grab this whole virus and then both are expelled and that is what you see in nasal drop or the cough or mucus. But after all those, still there is something left. And therefore, those residual virus along with mucin, they go and reach lung. Once they reach lung, the alveolar macrophages take up them and they get activated and that those macrophages trigger a short transient inflammation and this inflammation means a lot of immune cells are attracted to the lung and interacted with those host cells which are infected with the virus or the macrophages which are also infected with the virus and then the virus is killed and after the virus is killed with time the inflammation subsides and that is how the infection is cleared and the patient uh, recovers. By contrast, when this bolus of mucus containing huge number of viruses go to the lung and the alveolar macrophages are virus infected, they secrete TNF-alpha and interleukin-6 and lot of chemokines, lot of chemokines. And besides this, they also uh, let this mucus accumulate on the alveolar cells. And you know in alveolus, there are two types of cells, so pneumocytes 1 and pneumocytes 2. And this pneumocyte 1 and pneumocytes 2 secrete different chemicals, which are grossly or collectively known as lung surfactant and this lung surfactant is very important for preventing any pleural damage 
uh, which we one may incur during the inspiration and expiration. So that surfactant secreting cells are damaged and therefore those cells um, are necrotized. In addition, there is another type of alveolar cells which are required for gas exchanges. Now, because of this mucus accumulation and other um, pro-inflammatory cytokines, those cells are also damaged. As a result, the gas exchange is reduced quite significantly. So basically what you see here, that the alveolar cells are destroyed and the in, there is impairment in aeration. So the oxygen saturation that you see, this is a very common term, you know, the, what you see in the desert is impaired aeration oxygen saturation, PO2. All those things uh, decrease. As a result, what happens, there is rise in lung circulation. So the pulmonary circulation is increased in order to compensate for this impaired aeration. Now, when this lung circulation goes beyond the limit, then what happens? The lung pressure, the pulmonary circulation pressure is 15 mm of Hg to 9 mm of Hg. So this is a much, much smaller pressure and much smaller difference compared to the systemic pressure, which is 120 mm of Hg to 80 mm of Hg. So what happens if there is tremendous increase in lung circulation, then this pressure uh, is deleterious to the lung. To prevent this, there is a receptor known as pulmonary J receptor, which then actually triggers um, a neural reaction, which can, uh, which actually brings down this pulmonary circulation to the normal level. Now, because of this lung damage, because of this uh, pulmonary J receptor inactivation, uh, and many other uh, neuronal effects to the midbrain, where we have the inspiration and expiration controlling nuclei like uh, nucleus ambiguous or pre-Bertzinger complex and the, the sensory neurons in the prefrontal cortex, all those are sort of affected. And therefore, you can imagine with all these distractions and impairments, what happens, the, uh, the respiration is severely impaired. Now, besides this mechanism of respiratory um, impairment, this TNF-alpha-IL-6 and chemokines release leads to a cascade of inflammation which popularly known as cytokine storm. Now this also causes the release of reactive oxygen species and nitric oxides. These are very highly active um, free radicals which causes nitrosylation of different uh, amino acids and then the lipids are peroxidized and as a result the integrity of cellular membrane or the other proteins are compromised. And besides this uh, cascade of inflammation, what it triggers is a compensatory anti-inflammatory response, primarily done by IL-10, IL-22, or interleukin-10, or interleukin-22, and transforming growth factor beta, which is known as TGF-beta. So these three are the mediators that counter any kind of inflammation or this cytokine storm. But at the same time, not only do they try to counter the inflammation, they also suppress the antiviral response mediated by TNF-alpha and interferons. And TGF-beta also induces lung fibrosis. So once the lung fib is fibrosed, then the flexibility of lung to expand or to contract that is lost, and as a result, with all these impaired aeration, lung damage, then fibrosis, 
then uh, suppression of the viral response, then the destruction of cells by nitrosylation and lipid peroxidation, and then, of course, the pulmonary J receptor inactivation leading to pulmonary edema, accumulation of fluid. So the lung weight goes up from 800 gram to almost 1.8 kg. So more than double, and therefore, so these people cannot breathe in, and therefore, then they collapse. So basically, this is the sort of underlying mechanism, physiological or pathophysiological mechanism, by which the patient, patients who die out of COVID-19 undergo these kind of reactions. So basically, what we see is one of these uh, because this is a very acute reaction, uh, and that means very quick reaction, generally the, the innate immune receptors play a significant role. And one of the major uh, innate immune receptors is toll-like receptors that recognize different ligands on the pathogen. For example, TLR4 uh, recognizes LPS, but there are many other ligands which are recognized by TLR4. TLR13 recognizes ribosomal RNA. TLR9 recognizes these CPG DNA repeats. CPG is cytosine, phosphate, guanosine, repeats of these. And then TLR2, TLR1 dimer or TLR2, TLR6 dimer, which recognize the varieties of lipoproteins and TLR5, which recognizes flagellin. And then there are other TLRs, like TLR3, which recognizes double-stranded RNA, or TLR7 and 8, which recognize single-stranded RNA. And our SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus with single-stranded RNA. So TLR7 and 8 play a significant role. But besides that, you have to remember that RNA is also converted, can be converted to DNA by reverse transfer had there been any um, uh, co-infection and the possibility of that reverse transcriptase uh, converting it to that and therefore this is also another possibility and then uh, I have already discussed about all these three and then TLR11 and 12 which recognize profiline or calcium binding proteins. So basically what happens there are all these different uh, toll like receptors, but in human, you don't have this TLR 11, 12, and 13. In human, we have up to TLR 10. So basically, once these TLRs, for example, TLR 7 and 8 in human, recognize this single strand RNA of SARS CoV 2 virus, they react. The cells are activated. So this is the toll like receptor. Let's say TLR 7 and TLR 8, a horseshoe like structure. And this is where the ligand is bound. This is where the ligand binds. And then they're activated. And then they trigger signaling through MOID88, myeloid differentiation factor 88, and NF kappa B, which is nuclear factor kappa B, or IRF3, interferon regulatory factor 3, or TIF1 alpha, which is hypoxia induced factor 1 alpha, etc. And then all these factors lead to IRAC1, insulin receptor activated kinase 1 mediated activation of NLRP3, caspase 1 and 11 activate, I mean, containing these inflammosomes, and they, causes the infl they cause the inflammation. So this is what happens when there is a very strong cascade of inflammatory cytokines release, what you see, the cytokine storm. So this TLR activation or recognition of the single-stranded RNA of SARS-CoV-2 by TLR7 and 8, leading to this signaling and IRAC1-mediated inflammasome activation leading to those cytokines. So this is the underlying mechanism of cytokine storm in SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what I have done here to show you that there are three loci of TLR functions. One is where the cells 
release certain factors like for T cells, they secrete IL-12, MHC molecule, CD-80, for inflammation, they secrete TNF-alpha and IL-8. For repairing the tissues, they secrete IL-10 and TG-beta. For metabolism, IL-1, etc., etc. And then once the cells are activated, then within the cells there are also certain functions like NF-kappa B and AP1 activation, then phagocytic oxidase. Oxy, of, I mean, activation, which leads to the production of the active oxygen species. They activate hexokinase, so propelling glycolysis forward, and then membrane transport, epigenetic memory, cytoskeletal activation or reorganization. And then all these effects can be cell type specific. For example, they cause stem cell differentiation, platelet splicing of different proteins, and B cells proliferation and neutrophil degranulation, mast cell degranulation, macrophage activation. There are many of these cell types which ever express uh, these toll like receptors. They have their cell type specific functions triggered by TLR recognizing their specific ligands. So in any case, so basically what we show here that so far that the SARS-CoV-2 infection in population can lead to two different kinds of reaction. In one case, some, the population, that's the subpopulation of people, clear the infection because there is a balanced inflammation. And in the other case, uh, where the people cannot get rid of the virus, they have a huge number of uh, different kinds of pathophysiological reactions causing the lung damage, and they ultimately die of rest and then we have shown how TLR can play a significant role in that cytokine storm and other cellular damages. So what next? So do we need medicine like we have shown in the second slide? Three different target places to control COVID or you can take care of your health and then nature takes care of the disease. So basically there are these two different I mean, philosophies about the nature and taking care of the disease by Voltaire and Oliver Cromwell. But basically what we see is the majority of the people, 95% of the people, they still feel at home. So these people need to stay at home and stay well hydrated and if they have any kind of symptoms, for example, this TNF-alpha, IL-6, etc., prostaglandin, they can uh, actually raise the temperature by working on the hypothalamic thermoregulatory centers. And in such cases, when there is fever, there is pain, people can take acetaminophen, which is basically uh, more popularly known as paracetamol and found in Tylenol, Crocine, Dolo, etc. that reduces fever by working on brain and pain by elevated pain perception threshold of the pain receptor in the periphery. So basically what we need is uh, a good amount of rest uh, we need to strengthen our lung by breathing exercises and must avoid cold because, you know, the mucin and uh, all those um, reactions in the lung will precipitate if we get cold. So we must avoid cold, keep ourselves warm, do a breathing exercise and take rest and take a lot of water. So that is the key to recover. Now, when this does not happen, because you can get infected from many different sources. So what is the first step is that because this SARS-CoV-2 is an enveloped virus and the envelope is made of lipids, these lipids can be washed with soap or alcohol. And that is why we have the sanitizers or here we have the soap. So basically, the hygiene is very important. 
So if we maintain a good health, healthy lifestyle, and we have uh, a good hygiene and take care that we don't contaminate ourselves from all these many different places, uh, we can stay healthy and avoid this infection. And finally, uh, you know that nitric oxide here, so people in Scandinavian country, I think Norway, they have come up with this um, aerosolic nitric oxide, which can kill coronavirus. So that is another aspect. Um, so basically, uh, these are the things that can be done without uh, the supervision of a registered physician or without going to the hospital. So if that does not take care of the virus, then what next? So you really need much uh, more elaborate therapy uh, for your COVID-19. So we have three different drugs. Uh, one that targets the virus at three different phases, for example, entry inhibitor, I have shown you. Then the polymerase inhibitor. This is a RNA dependent RNA polymerase because this is what the enzyme which extends and replicates the viral RNA into more viral RNAs and mRNA and then the translation into proteins. And remdesivir is here, one of them that you know, but there are many others. And then there is protease inhibitor because if the proteases um, are inhibited, then all these polymerase replicates, etc., they will not be produced because the whole thing is comes out as one protein precursor. So the lopina, lopinavir and ritonavir are those protease inhibitors, but there are many others. And then there are drugs that target the host immune response like dexamethasone, which suppresses the cytokine storm and tocilizumab anti-IL-6 receptor that blocks IL-6. And that is a key uh, point, key node in amplifying the inflammation and cyclosporin A, which is a general immunosuppressor. You hear basically that we are using dexamethasone, cyclosporin A, or tocilizumab. All are basically suppression of the pro-inflammatory immune response. But you'll have to remember that these pro-inflammatory immune responses are also very important for preventing the other infections. And therefore, the patients which have indiscriminate uses of dexamethasone, the steroids, they are susceptible to many secondary infections. And one of them, you know very well now, the black fungus, which is a sort of misnomer, but let's say fungal infections, and that can be uh, life-taking. So all these require, administration of all these drugs require supervision of registered physicians. And then there are drugs which are not necessarily antiviral. Originally, they are either antibacterial or antiprotozoals, but they are uh, taken because of emergency and being used as antivirals. So we will discuss this remdesivir, azithromycin, and artemisinin in the next slides. So what happens? How does remdesivir work? Remdesivir, remember, is not a drug but a prodrug. A prodrug is a compound which requires metabolism before the metabolites produced can actually execute the function of the drug. So here, the remdesivir, which is a prodrug, you will see it is cleaved in here after this sugar, and then what happens? This, um, um, when it is cleaved, then we get this metabolite here, and then it is phosphorylated to give first remdesivir triphosphate and then uh, dephosphorylated to give us remdesivir monophosphate. And this remdesivir monophosphate is incorporated 
during the replication. So now what happens, this remdesivir monophosphate, when incorporated in the growing RNA chain, inhibits this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase translocation after three nucleotides. So let's say at zero point, this instead of a base, this remdesivir monophosphate is incorporated, then the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will translocate for three further nucleotides, and then it will stall on the fourth because it will not be able to slide on that. So this is a steric hindrance effect on these uh, um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and as a result, no further replication. And there is repurposing of antibacterial to antivirals. This azithromycin you have heard is an antibiotic and has significant antiviral activities against Ebola, Zika, RSV, influenza, enterovirus, and rhinovirus. And this induces production of interferons that can kill the virus. And AZM also induces MDF5 and RIG1 that recognize the virus and trigger innate immune response. So the, besides TLR, MDF5 and RIG1 are the other innate immune receptors which can recognize the virus and trigger innate immune response. So these are basically the mechanisms of action of azithromycin, which is via triggering the post inflammatory response. And then there is repurposing of anti-malarial drug to antiviral. So EV2, you know, got this Nobel Prize for discovering artemisinin, which is a product from the plant known as Artemisia annua. And it is known as Qinghao in China. And in Madagascar, this plant is extracts, is made to a drink, and is used to treat the COVID-19 patients. So. Basically, uh, we have discussed a lot about many different drugs that can be used uh, selectively, of course, on for treating this COVID-19 disease. But the person who sort of pioneered these drugs, which at that time he suggested as the magic bullet because they would kill the pathogen, right? So as long as the pathogen remained the same. So Paul Ehrlich, what he found that these magic bullets can kill pathogens unless they are mutated. That single magic bullet stopped working as soon as the pathogen learned to survive with mutations. And with these mutations, the benefits but the first half during this 20th century was lost at a later half because we have all these drug resistant pathogens now. So how do we tackle these drug resistant pathogens? Because now we can use multiple magic bullets. So you must have heard that not only remdesivir, but also hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, etc., etc., all are put together. The reason is this original magic bullet is not working alone. So we have synergistically working other drugs and then the other drug which can enhance the bioavailability of the original drug. And then there are other drugs which can reverse the resistance by some other mechanism. So basically a combination of these three different kinds of drugs or maybe even more can have a new strategy of combination therapy in the 21st century, which is what you show, what you see in the treatment of malaria, for example. So you have sulfadoxin pyrimethamine I mean, along with artemisinin, so or lumefantrine along with artemisinin. So basically, this combination therapy is very important. Like you see, the highly active antiretroviral therapy or heart therapy in case of HIV. So you can always inhibit the spreading inhibitor, protease inhibitor, and then the reverse transcriptase inhibitor all together to kill the HIV. So basically, this is the concept that 
polar leaks magic bullet magic bullets can be combined to tackle these drug resistant viruses so basically yes this old strain can now be new strain and you know there are uh, many different variants of the sars cov 2 virus has been report have been reported and almost every single week you get as many viruses are sequenced you get variants and many different variants are found to be uh, very different in their behavior and also in the symptoms they give rise to so here you will see the sars cov 2 before old strain is giving three symptoms but here you get many different other symptoms and that's because their proteins are now changed so basically this causes uh, not only the problem for therapy because you have the targets mutated and therefore bypassing your magic bullet and it also causes problem for vaccine because you must have heard how these uh, all these discussions on which vaccine works against all or does not work against uh, the south african variant or the uk variant or the brazilian variant it's all because of these mutations so basically what we find is the first part mode of resistance that we must maintain good health general hygiene distancing from the virus chemotherapy and still we have the problems of drug resistance that we can uh, bypass or tackle by combining different drugs together by deriving the combination therapy so now we come to the vaccine knowing that okay the drugs will have their side effects and the drugs may not necessarily be all the time conquering the virus because they are mutated in the targets and the bypass so the other possibility is to have the prevention because prevention is always better than cure and this prevention happens when you prepare yourself beforehand and that preparation comes with virus so we have the coronavirus vaccine effort going since last year january february as soon as the virus was discovered and its fatality uh, of the infection was realized so when this was started this is based on march data we had first phase 42 vaccines these are related to safety and doses of the vaccine then it moves to phase two of the 42 started only 30 reached to phase two in which phase we basically uh, have more elaborate safety assessment for the vaccine and then it goes to the phase three so 42 becomes 21 there so this is a large scale efficacy besides the safety and once the phase three is cleared then it goes for authorization but what you will see is that many many vaccines are now coming out without full fda auth authorization or approval they are called emergency use authorization or eua because of the emergency situation so this is the early or limited use and here we have six vaccines and now you know what are all those and then finally they are all going to be are sort of approved for full use but in the process there are many rejected or the trial abandoned so basically now we know that we have at least three in the field of these six here one is Covishield, another is Covaxin, another is Sputnik, and another which is already given to the Serum Institute, which is Novavax. So four we know for sure, and there could be some other. The Novavax here will be marketed as Covax by Serum Institute. So here we have a list of rather short list of these different companies which are making vaccines and their vaccine agent and the status so what you will find here the pfizer biontech which is the pfizer vaccine we know that 
which is mrna based moderna is another company which is also mrna based and then gamalia which is adenovirus vaccine so what is this we will discuss later so this whole rna for the spike protein is converted into dna and put in an adenovirus which is a dna virus and this is from russia and then oxford astrazeneca we know this is also another engineered adenovirus vaccine then cancino is a china and canada joint um, project which is also adenovirus based then johnson and johnson also adenovirus based so these are all in market now and then victor institute from russia also has the protein spike protein based vaccine and then novavax has the spike protein with a very specific saponin based adjuvant but it was it is now approved not awaited anymore and then sinopharm which is an inactivated which is chemically inactivated vaccine and how that has been chemically inactivated is remains a trade secret it is not known and then sinovac has produced another and sinopharm one has produced another chemically inactivated these are all from china all chemically inactivated viruses and then our own indian virus which is an attenuated virus this is naturally attenuated somehow this clone was isolated at niv pune national institute of virology in pune and was given to bharat biotech in hyderabad to make these viruses and these are now you know is the covaxin so basically these are different vaccines which are now marketed and this is where you have different characteristics of these vaccines so the mrna vaccines are from moderna and pfizer and you will see their doses two doses four weeks apart two doses three weeks apart and their refrigeration requirement in which country they are you know approved and uh, these are all mrna for the spike protein of the virus then there is another category like we have suggested that the adenoviral expression of sars cov2 spike protein this is to dna and this is oxford astrazeneca covaxin this is johnson johnson and then this is gamalia so this is also the viral vector vaccine and then vaccination with whole sars cov2 virus we have two in this category one is from sinopharm which is chemically inactivated virus but there are two others in china only and then covaxin which is attenuated virus in india but now you know because the vaccines are not there so you have to take the second shot 6 weeks later and then there is this novavax which uh, which has already come to india but not yet marketed it is with uh, serum institute india private limited uh, which will be known as covavax uh, as uh, guessed by some people and uh, the technology is prefusion s protein which is the spike protein is a trimer so it is the monomer which is before fusion they have taken this sub unit and put it into a nanoparticle of saponin based matrix a now what is this saponin based matrix a what other molecule is there it is not known to us but this is what they have made as the vaccine and its efficacy unpublished is 95.6 uh, when the phase 3 trials was done and now it is authorized and us uk mexico rsa now in india as well and you will again require two doses three weeks apart and refrigeration request to 18 weeks apart so covax is going to be most probably uh, the vaccine of choice because all other vaccines although to a varied, varied extent have been reported to induce different kind of uh, side effects and primarily they are chills thanda lage then headache pain tiredness redness or swelling at the injection site and in case of pfizer bio and tech 
to have triggered anaphylactic shock, but only one in uh, more than a million. And then Moderna also report the same, Johnson Johnson also the same, Oxford AstraZeneca also have the same problem of side effects. But why Covavax or Novavax or NVX COV2373 as the company name is? Because it is giving best protection against wild type and both South African in UK variants and now against the P1 Brazilian variant as well. So far, no side effects are reported. Strong and adjuvenated immune response, so memory likely long lasting because this is a very crucial point. What we started the premise with vaccine is that it will prepare the people to, with a memory to fight against any future attack of this virus. So what it means that this vaccination must induce a memory which will be required for recognition of the virus whenever it comes later. So what it means that the memory has to be long lasting. But you know, in our case, in SARS-CoV-2 cases, what happened? Many people got vaccination and despite that they got infection and many of the people had been hospitalized and many people died even after vaccination. So the memory induced by all these vaccines had been a question. It is not clear whether that is true or all these phenomena, all these cases that have been registered that even after vaccination people got infected is due to something else because they received placebo or because they did not respond to the vaccine at all, no T cell or no antibody produced, we do not know. So that study is not known, but definitely lack of triggering memory or the inability to establish long lasting memory is certainly a possibility. And therefore a vaccine with a strong adjuvant that is likely to induce a long lasting memory is of the choice. So that is why Covax or Novavax could be very interesting and important. And this is extremely strong and efficacious neutralizing antibody inducing vaccine and evolving a mutant virus therefore is less likely. So the point is this fifth point we need to understand that let's say there are 100 viruses producing or rather exposing different kinds of proteins of the same protein and now because of this vaccine we have the antibodies produced which can neutralize 60 of them which means that because of that vaccine induced antibody response or the pool of antibodies which were triggered or induced by the vaccine only 60 of the variants are neutralized, which means those 40 remaining have escaped. Now, these 40 may have muted further and in the process of stronger immune response because of vaccine, maybe 38 are eliminated. So even in this case, we still have two mutant viruses left. And these two mutant viruses are those which could escape host immune response or host resistance mechanism and the vaccine as well. And therefore, these two viruses are bound to be or very likely to be deadly. And therefore, the choice of vaccine can be very important in terms of two things. One, how long lasting the memory is and second, how many of the viruses of the pool that one has have been neutralized and eliminated. If the escape variant is a deadly one, then that will spread and again cause another wave of virus 
uh, infection which will not be um, neutralized by any of these vaccines and perhaps even the drug. So we do not know about any of these for sure, but definitely these are the possibilities and the limitations of vaccination. And therefore, uh, un these are different issues about the vaccinations that we need to remember. So now there are many other vaccines I have listed here. Uh, people all over the world are trying for their own vaccine. So now how do we get these vi vaccines made? We'll have to remember that for any vaccine, we need an antigen. So the vaccine preparation starts with the preparation of an antigen. Because spike protein of this virus is the key protein which is required from the very beginning till end. And also for virus dissemination and spreading. So spike protein was chosen as the antigen against which the vaccine has to be directed. And therefore, the RNA for vaccine coding this RNA coding for this spike protein was cloned and cloned as DNA in this adenovirus. You can see this round SARS-CoV-2 virus versus hexagonal adenovirus. So this is a DNA virus in which the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein RNA is saved or cloned as a DNA. And now this adenovirus will express, this DNA will express through mRNA this spike protein. This is called the central dogma of molecular biology, whereby the genetic material is transcribed to make the mRNA or messenger RNA, that means the RNA which is the message for creating that protein. And that message is translated into the form of protein, which is the polymer of different amino acids. So this central dogma of molecular biology is followed to make this vaccine. So we have the adenovirus 5 or adenovirus 26, which is replication deficient and have this expression of this SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So the virus antigen is made. Now, when we introduce this virus encoded or expressed spike protein in the form of a vaccine, then it is internalized into the host cells, for example, in macrophages or dendritic cells. And this is enclosed in a bubble called endosomes. And this is where this is degraded. And then this mRNA is produced. And this mRNA is translated to spike protein, right? And then this spike protein, which is the subunit, is proteolytically processed. That means the spike protein is a very big protein. Then they're cleaved into a much smaller fractions or fragments of this protein. And then this S protein fragments are surfaced to in, the, in a complex with a molecule named as major histocompatibility complex or MHC. So these spike protein fragments are complexed with host MHC molecule and presented on the surface. Once these molecules are on the surface, this is recognized by these receptors, which are the B cell receptor on B cells or the T cell receptor here on T cells. So on the left, we have this S protein as parts of MHC class one or class two and going to T helper cell or T cytotoxic cell or to B cell. And these T helper cells also have the B cells. And as a result, these antigen specific B cells now producing these antibodies, these Y shaped molecules you can see here, these are the uh, antibody molecules which has the specificity to bind to this spike protein. Now, once these antibodies are made, we are now having the vaccine activated B cells or T helper cells, these 
antibodies bind to the spike protein and neutralize the virus. And these T cells, the killer T cells, recognize all those cells, host cells, which express the viral protein on their surface. And therefore, because of these antigen specific receptors, these killer T cells recognize these cells which express these viral proteins and kill these infected T cells. And therefore, the all the host cells which are, um, or rather most of the host cells uh, which are infected with the virus are now eliminated. So basically what happens then, what we have seen that there are two groups of people, one who can handle the virus all by themselves. And fortunately, they are the majority of the people, 90 to 95%. And then there will be this minority of the people who cannot handle it and they need to go to hospital. And because of, that's because of the damage in the lung. So we have discussed what are the pathophysiological reactions that force the people to go to hospital and under what condition. And then once they arrive at hospital, what are the treatments given under the supervision of a registered physicians? And despite that, what can be the problems because of the side effects of the drugs or the loss of efficacy of the drugs because of drug resistance virus? And then we have seen the vaccines and this is primarily against the spike protein because that's on the surface, easily accessible, and also the major protein required from beginning to end by the virus to survive in a host. And despite all these, we know that even the vaccine may not be able to provide us the long lasting memory. And there could be uh, a sort of selection mechanism to propel the development of the vaccine resistant mutant virus strains. So basically what we need is, we need to prepare ourselves against this infection. So take vaccine. So besides maintaining hygiene and health, take vaccine and then wear a mask, sanitize hands often and maintain physical distance so that virus is not sprayed and we can keep all ourselves as um, healthy as a community as a whole population and thank you very much for your interest for your uh, attention so if you have any questions we can discuss so thank you very much sir so thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Shaha, for this nice and lucid discussions about what SARS-CoV-2 is, how it infects us, what can potentially act as medicines for it, and how those medicines act, and finally about COVID vaccines and their mechanism of action. So I am sure that uh in your in in your mind there are several questions which you uh, which you are wish to ask dr uh, dr shaha so now there is a brief uh, interactive session please participants please ask the question sir i am dr kollan okay. from Siuri Birbhum. okay please uh, please Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon sir good afternoon uh, uh, bolum, bolum. <laughs> Actually, we are spellbounded by your lecture. Uh, one uh, question okay. I have. We, have, we have heard that ecosperin or uh, aspirin uh, can help uh, in COVID-19. Uh, actually, the question is, can ecosperin benefit us in COVID-19? That I think uh, your question is definitely uh, interesting and important and um, I think many people will have this question but being a non-medico I don't think I am empowered or it will be legitimate to answer whether it will be beneficial or not 
Oh, so that is one. And if some doctors are prescribing this, definitely that means they may actually find it helpful. But definitely these are not antivirals. You know it. And yes. it, more, it may be just, you know, relieving the, some of the symptoms which are causing discomfort to the patient. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We are enriched by your lecture. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm just saying one thing that uh, the feedback link has now been given in the uh, chat box. So you can uh, uh, fill up the feedback form and the e-certificate will automatically be delivered to your email ID. Uh, any other question? Sir, I have a question. Uh, is plasma therapy effective over coronavirus? One question. And then, uh, can anybody take different vaccines in different times uh, for getting better immunity? Uh, you see, the first is the plasma. See, the plasma therapy like I said in the vaccine response mechanism, it's because of the antibody, right? So if the antibodies are not neutralizing, the plasma will not work. So it is absolutely essential for the plasma to work. The plasma must have the neutralizing antibody. So that has to be demonstrated first. So there should be one selection mechanism for which plasma to be used and which not to be. That is the first question. And uh, what was the second question? Uh, can anyone take different vaccines in different times? Ah, right, right, right. Uh -huh. So what you have asked, you see different vaccines, I have showed you the list. Most of the vaccines, not most actually, so far all of the vaccines have targeted only one protein, which is spike protein, right? So the target is same. So what will be the advantage if you take two or four or six? Because the target is same. Okay. For example, when we talk about combination chemotherapy, the targets are different, right? You have one set of drugs, or one drug which is against entry, another drug which is against protease, another drug which is against RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, so that these three can have combinatorial effect, right? But when your antibodies or the T cells will see only one protein, one peptide antigen, then if you take many different vaccines, what will be the benefit? Right. Okay, so you, it is unlikely that if you take uh, multiple vaccines, uh, it may not really help. But this obviously uh, has not been experimented yet. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Paul. Okay. So I have a question, sir. Uh, first of all, Thank you for such a lucid uh, presentation. I am Dr. Shongjukta Choudhury of Zoology Department for Kitchat College. Uh, uh, it was pretty relevant to whatever we teach. So I do have a question. And it is, uh, uh, can you comment on the uh, safety of mRNA vaccines? Like the, they are going to uh, launch the mRNA vaccine soon. So. Uh, what is your comment on the safety, not efficacy, the safety on mRNA vaccines? You have any idea? Thank you. Yes, see, um, any vaccine, the, its trial starts with the safety analysis, right? I have shown you the very first slide on the vaccine was that it started with 42 vaccine candidates with the safety analysis. That is phase one. And once those sure, cleared, sure. then they go to the second phase, which is more elaborated safety trial. Once you cross the phase one and phase two for all sorts of safety ensuring, then you go for the phase three, which is about the efficacy trial. So I think if any vaccine or any drug, any therapy that has come out of 
you know, past the phase three trial or even farther, then definitely they had been, you know, cleared for their safety. I mean, you do not have any personal note on uh, that. I mean, uh, of course, safety, uh, I know industry safety and uh, we all know how that right. works. I mean, uh, you know, uh, the approval and everything. I mean, as a scientist, what do you suggest? How safe are mRNA vaccines? That's what I am asking, actually. Thank no, you. It will be very difficult for me for two reasons. First of all, so for the safety is concerned, we have shown you some of the data that all everyone who goes through the net will find it. And the second is I haven't really um, done any experiment myself. That is why the time title of the lecture was a view from the bunker but if you talk about the uh, general what is the likelihood the mrnas will be recognized by toll like receptor 7 and 8 and people may have different um, you know snps of tlr 7 and 8 in some cases tlr and 7 and 8 may not recognize this and in some cases uh, may recognize it and uh, give a vigorous response. But having said that, I must clarify this mRNA before uh, it can be, or rather the time when it is being recognized by the TLR also a significant part of it will also be translated into the protein and therefore the protein will be presented to the T cells. So mRNA itself, uh, is very less likely to cause any kind of problem by itself. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Sir, no. Dr. 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 Paul, where we can find uh, feedback from, sir? In the, in the chat box, there is a link of feedback from. Okay. okay. Sir, I have a question. I am a chemistry honor student. Yes. Uh, th first of all, thank you for your lecture. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got a lot of knowledge from your lecture. Thank you a lot. So my question is: Recently, Central Health Ministry has issued a guideline that if a person is affected by COVID-19 and also recovers with and also recovers, then he or she doesn't need to take any vaccine for at least three months. So does this make any sense? Yes, of course. Uh, I think it does. Um obey the i mean the laws of immune response or immunity or immune system because if you take a rabbit you know this is a major problem in many of the cases uh, people have seen it if you keep on injecting one thing continuously means over injection there can be two things one the immune system may become tolerated which you call high dose tolerance but if it is uh, you know, with some uh, time gaps, it will still remain. The previous injection effect will still remain. And then you give another, then you give another, then what will happen? There will be hypersensitivity reactions. And these hypersensitivity reactions are very harmful for the body. So there can be dilatative hypersensitivity response and uh, that can be really harmful to the person. Now, when someone comes out of this disease, which means their whole immune system was uh, chronically exposed to this virus for let's say three weeks or four weeks or five weeks. And not only that, they also might have uh, other secondary infections, which also have uh, activate a lot of T cells and produce a lot of cytokines. So basically, and also a lot of tissue uh, re-engineering or tissue rearrangement. So what happens at that time, immediately if you give vaccine, then what will happen? You are adding fuel to the fire. So it will be, uh, it will likely cause hypersensitivity reaction and cause a lot of harms to the person. So this is my take on um, what may happen if someone coming out of 
disease or one taking one vaccine and immediately get another uh, this vaccine, then this will be the reaction. Okay, sir. Thanks a lot. Any any more question from anyone? So, I think there is no question. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I think no more question uh, here. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, now I am uh, requesting uh, our head of the department, Dr. Pogamoy Pal, uh, to give the vote of thanks. Thank you. Mm, so we are, we are almost at the end of today's program. Hope all of you have passed some beautiful moments with Dr. Shah. We are really thankful to Dr. Shah who has shared some of his valuable times with us to present us a wonderful afternoon. Hope we shall be fortunate enough to hear you again, Dr. Shah, in future. We are also thankful to our principal sir and to all other members of our college, including those in college administration for extending their wholehearted support to make this program a big success. And finally, our wholehearted thanks to all the participants on whom the success of any program mainly depends. Thank you all and sincerely pray for good health for all of you and your families in the coming days. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Shaha, once Thank again you. for Thank giving you. us this valuable time. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, in which box uh, we can give the